Uh, my name is Steve Haraguchi, and I'm the director of AI programs here. Uh, we launched this program about two years ago, and so we'll be talking a little bit about the AI program, what it entails, uh, what classes we offer. Uh, but the feature of today's webinar is really to showcase some projects that happen in a specific course of ours, which is one of our favorite and most fun courses, Natural Language Understanding, which is led by Professor Chris Potts. Um, so before we dive in and uh, I introduce the speakers, um, a little bit about our program. This program was created in September 2019. So we're coming up on, uh, what is that? Uh, three, coming up on three years. And the idea of this program was a little bit different from a lot of professional education or a lot of online education that previously existed in that all of these professional courses are directly based off of graduate level courses at Stanford. And so we do use the lectures and many of the same lecture videos and content from the graduate level courses at Stanford. Um, and then we mix, we create a mix of programming assignments and written assignments that are also taken from the graduate courses to give what we believe to be a very high level, very rigorous and very intensive uh, professional education program. And we make some slight differences and adjustments to the course material, just to give working professionals a little bit of added flexibility, uh, both in the way that they schedule and, and choose to take the courses, as well as a little bit of flexibility in terms of how they go about completing the assignments, uh, knowing that all working, you know, working professionals are likely to have very busy schedules family schedules, and so we try to build in a little bit of flexibility um, into how you can go about completing the courses. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the details uh, at the end of this presentation. We'll have a sort of Q and open Q&A about the program itself. But really, just quickly at present, our program offers six courses um, covering the base, you know, foundational AI techniques um, to foundational uh, approaches to machine learning, but really diving under the hood a lot of a lot of algorithms that you uh, likely have used or, or may be learning about elsewhere, um, as well as electives. We like to think of uh, uh, more elective courses with two options around natural language processing and understanding. Uh, we've recently added a re reinforcement learning course, as well as a machine learning with graphs course. The target audience for this program is practicing scientists and engineers um, who are seeking a very in-depth sort of foundational knowledge of AI. So most of our classes, you're actually not using common packages for a lot of machine learning approaches. You're actually developing them from scratch uh, with the rationale and the approach being by really understanding what goes under the hood of a lot of modern approaches, uh, it puts you in the best position to deeply understand what's happening, uh, to put them into practice, to, um, to uh, apply them to your work as well as potentially to invent new approaches uh, in your future. So um, with that though, today's main feature is to hear from two learners who completed the program. So they actually can speak to their experience um, completing uh, three classes to complete the professional certificate, uh, but we'll feature their experience in one of our classes, which is natural language understanding. So um, our two students are Navdeep and Anika. Navdeep will be first. The natural language understanding class uh, is actually next offered uh, beginning in about two weeks, January 24th. All the classes are 10 weeks. And uh, you can see the topics here that this course focuses on. Um, it takes a broad view of many different natural language understanding approaches as it relates to uh, word representations, uh, natural language inference. You can see all the topics here, um, modern sort of contextual word representations as well as how to put together an NLU project. So in addition to assignments that take place in this class, there's also an open-ended project uh, that is a topic of your own choosing. You'll actually pick a, a topic related to the course material that is most interesting to you, uh, find and select a data set, and put together a project. And in this class, we have the option of um, doing a project in groups or uh, doing a project individually. So what we've decided to do here, since this is our next class that's starting, is again, we've in, invited Navdeep and Anika um, here to share a little bit about what they did in this class. They'll each have about uh, 10 minutes to share uh, what they did in the natural language understanding class. They'll talk a little bit about their experience 
um, uh, in the course and potentially broadly in the program. And we'll have plenty of time for question and answers at the end, uh, both about our prog uh, program generally, as well as uh, about their projects and what they did and what they learned and how they may be applying what they learned um, to their their work today. So uh, before we I introduce Navdeep, who's our first speaker, I just want to really thank both of them for making the time uh, to prepare uh, a couple of slides uh, for you all to see today, as well as for taking the time to um, set aside the hour uh, to join this webinar and talk a little bit about their experience in the program. So with that, as I mentioned, we'll go into more detail of the program at the very end of this. But without further ado, oh, here's a one slide about the projects. They are open-ended uh, and they're free choice. And they can you actually can complete these projects on a work topic. So I'm actually not sure if Navdeep or Anika created uh, projects related to their day-to-day -day work, but that is something uh, that, folks, um, that folks are able to do. So you can actually do it within the context of your current uh, employment, if you'd like. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Navdeep, uh, who'll share a little bit about his project. And uh, we'll have time for a couple questions about his project at the end of his presentation before we move on to Anika. But then after that, at the very end, we'll have um, plenty of time to talk about the program. So Navdeep, if you can hear us, uh, feel free to uh, go live here with your camera and mic and, uh, and start to share. Yep, uh, sounds good. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and thanks for introducing. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm Navdeep Jain. And uh, as mentioned, this was my paper, Customer Sentiment Analysis Using Weak Supervision for Customer Agent Chat. Uh, it's something I worked as a part of uh, CS XCS224 for you. And I'll be sharing more details about that as well as this was my third course in AI professional certificate, so we'll give some overview about it as well. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, I am Navdeep Jain. I work as a lead research engineer in applied AI research team at Comcast. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, what Comcast or what type of company it is, uh, it is US's largest uh, internet and cable provider company. Uh, and we have multiple verticals for uh, on which AI focuses. So until recently, my focus had been on voice and audio. And most recently, my role has changed where I'll be more focused towards chatbot. Um, so that is a bit about me. Now, moving to this particular course. So I have two slides on XCS224U. Two to one is like the key learning and then uh, second one is like uh, focusing particularly on the project that I worked on and how I came up with the idea for that project. So uh, again, you can find lots of details about the course uh, when you sign up, when you, uh, when you, you can find lots of details just by looking at uh, YouTube videos as well. Uh, but here are a few things that I think you perhaps won't get just by looking at videos. Uh, so the course uh, has three assignments and uh, four quizzes. Uh, one of the suggest I have key three suggestions for this course. Spend as much time as you can. All these three assignments, which are mentioned here, were relatedness, sentiment analysis, and pragmatic color descript description. Uh, the last question in all three assignments are build an original system. Uh, my recommendation is you spend as much time as you can uh, making the base system, trying to try to win the competition. So like for all these assignments, there is a back off and uh, it's a sort of competition. So always try to learn and try to apply something original. Uh, that would help you to understand all the key concepts which are being used in NLP recently or even in the past. And I think these are the key whenever you, when you have to come up with a new idea, if you have the better understanding of uh, some of these key concepts, that will help you to progress better in the later weeks. Uh, and again, I think one thing to understand, this course is 10 weeks. And when you have to come up with an original idea and write a paper, it is not a lot of time. So that's why this first three weeks becomes crucial that you spend lots of time 
understanding the key concept. Uh, so that is one. My second, my personal based, like there are multiple modules in the course, uh, but for me, the most useful was this contextual representation. Uh, this is the one like you, many of you might have heard about uh, models like BERT, uh, Roberta, but how they actually work under the hood. And then again, how you can practically use them, modify them, how you can train a classifier using it, or how you can fine tune it. All those things are discussed in module four. So I highly recommend that if that is something you are interested in, uh, you focus like particularly in this on this module. And this is like a generic uh, advice. So um, it's a 10 week of period and like, uh, you know, get ready for some sort of adversity, like be it a personal life or whatever. So for example, I'll, I'll give you my example. Uh, so I live in Philadelphia here uh, on East Coast in US. And while doing this course, uh, I live close to a Schuylkill River and we had a flooding in Schuylkill River. It has never happened in eight years. And I was without like, uh, like I needed to evacuate for five days and things like that. And then my workstation, basically MacBook was not working on one of the weekends. So the key takeaway there is uh, all the assignments mostly end on the Sunday. So don't wait until Saturday to finish your course. Of course, you have those five days extension and uh, you can exercise some other uh, method to not uh, waste your time. But I would suggest like, this is something for you to learn. And if you don't wait for the deadline, this will help you uh, to better prepare for the course. Uh, so those are like key idea about uh, pre paper writing phase. Uh, now in pa the paper writing phase is like, six weeks, the so first four weeks are uh, concepts, quizzes, and then the next phase is paper writing. Uh, and there are three phases. Uh, the key thing here is uh, you spend enough, like good attention in each phase so that uh, it helps you for the next phase. So if you spend good amount of time writing a better literature review, you can use that portion of that review in your final paper and it can help you contribute to sex and call introduction and related work. So uh, the key thing is consider this as a build up to the final paper and not as an ind independent entity. So that will help you uh, to write a final paper. Again, like uh, if you have never written a paper, then it is, uh, it is really uh, a learning experience because it can take really long time. So uh, prepare for each phase well. Uh, so for literature review, as I said, if you, this is the phase where you read how uh, other folks have worked on certain field and how they have applied certain AI concept uh, and things like that. And, and you have to summarize it. The second phase is experimental protocol. Now, always keep in mind, you know, it, you may get overexcited with the idea of key learning, but it's a 10 week course. So you have to uh, make sure that you finish your part within 10 weeks. And experimental protocol is the phase where you have to have the full end to end pipeline ready. Perhaps you don't want to use all the data that you have, perhaps you don't you want to use all the GPU time you have, but you want to have your full end to end system ready during this experimental protocol phase so that uh, you have you are 100% sure that you can deliver a final paper uh, after this phase. So this is a key phase where rather than spending all your time building a uh, complete end-to-end -end system, you build a prototype during this. And uh, also the writing over here will help you to write data matrix and model section in your final paper. Uh, and then the final paper. So key thing for final paper is um, I would say spend some time learning LaTeX. Uh, I don't know how, uh, if you are familiar with it, but it's a, it's a, another language to write a paper which is simpler uh, and it can be very useful once you know it and if you are going to spend 
uh, if you aspire to become a researcher and write lots of paper, of course, there is some learning curve involved. And I think this uh, course is a good platform for you to get started on that. Um, the Then moving to my particular paper and how I came up with the idea. So my paper, as I said, was customer sentiment analysis using Beak supervision for customer agent chat. Um, as soon as I, and I have made this paper public, so you can find it on uh, on the portal that is uh, for AI program. But at the same time, if you go to this link, you can read uh, the paper is publicly available. Um, the key thing here is, uh, as soon as I decided that I want to do this project, and luckily I, I'm also part of Applied AI research team here, and we have an established NLP team. So I reached out to our um, head of NLP research and uh, described about like, uh, I'm going to participate in this program. Is there any NLP uh, problem that we have, but none of other researchers are focused on? So that is how the conversation started. So even on the first week, I had access to some data, which was basically actual customer and agent chat uh, that we have for Comcast customer service. Now we have this data and we didn't have any label for it. So the question was what we can do with this data. And that is where it helped. I had some uh, sample data with me and then Throughout the course, as I learned concept about word relatedness, as I learned concept about sentiment analysis, um, and I could relate to, okay, perhaps I can apply this concept here, perhaps I can apply this concept here. So the process was like, I would visit, uh, I would have a meeting with our director of NLP every couple of weeks and bounce back ideas with him. And then by fourth week, I had some good understanding of like what I want to do with the data uh, and uh, which could be useful for the company. And that is where like, I think Steve mentioned this earlier. Uh, for me, I got lucky. It was feasible for me to convert this project as, as a work project. Um, so at Comcast, we have something called Lab Week during which you don't need to work on things. You work on your regular days. And that is what like, this was my fall Lab Week. Uh, which helped me to involve other folks as well uh, for annotations and things like that. Uh, and then other thing is like, once you have some idea, you always want to uh, bounce back with your mentors, which uh, you'll have here uh, in during the course. And Professor Part, like he holds office hours every Thursday throughout the course. So this is the only unique course where you have opportunity to interact with the professor himself. Uh, so you can bounce back the ideas with him uh, and can improve on it. So my process was working with professor part, working with my CF and a mentor at Comcast so that the idea is useful for Comcast as well. But at the same time, I can submit that as a paper. Um, and key contribution of this work uh, even though it may sound like uh, sentiment analysis is a solved problem, you will learn during the course that uh, the sentiment analysis mostly has been applied to customer reviews for uh, products on Amazon, for product on Yelp, uh, or uh, it has been applied to Twitter, but it has never been, uh, it, because this is like not easy data to get in public domain customer agent chat. So this was like sort of proprietary data and there is no uh, large scale data or analysis available for this particular domain. So, uh, and then other thing is uh, you will realize that uh, the, this data is key, but every concept that we mostly use in AI currently requires label data and acquiring label data itself is a huge challenge. And that's where like we came up with the idea that weak supervision is something has been picking up in last few years. And um, we focused on some recent work uh, which was done in summer last year and we tried to improve that. So our paper takes the mm, uh, previous work to next level where we applied a different way to generate weak labels. 
we also benchmark our work with the Google Cloud NLP API. So we can confidently say that this has some value rather than for an enterprise, it's always a question whether we should build our own or use a third party API. And using the paper, using the work, we were able to justify why it makes sense that of course we can deliver as good of model, but also there are a few unique features that we can provide we want get with the Google Cloud NLP API. And we also perform some domain specific analysis on it. So this is um, about paper. And I'll quickly summarize uh, about my overall experience for AI professional certificate. So I have, uh, I did three courses uh, and these are uh, three courses. Again, like um, there are lots of reason why I did it, uh, but uh, COVID is also one of that reason. Uh, this was like summer 2020 during COVID, nothing else to do. And I think this was the best use of time that I could have done. Um, and for natural language processing course, for me, key learning, I was already working on lots of computer visions uh, uh, stuff and I was working on audio. So if you are familiar with the audio, audio requires uh, it takes concept from uh, computer vision and it takes concept from NLP, but I have not worked enough on NLP. So this was like good stage for me to take it to next level. So I learned about RNN based model here, transformer and attention and attention is a really uh, key concept uh, or one of the best concepts that has come out in recent years. With this, I was able to apply attention in one of my models and was able to improve it. Uh, and we were able to train state of the art model for voice biometrics. Um, then uh, other course I did was in the winter that was AI principle and techniques. As Steve mentioned, this course takes uh, challenges you to a very next level where you you don't use any library like PyTorch or anything else. You have to write code originally. And if you really want to challenge yourself, both theoretically and practically, this is a really good course for that. And then the last one is natural language understanding, which is, uh, as I mentioned, most of the detail, but for me, key learning there was uh, using the bird family of models. So, and I had a very good time doing this course and I feel that the course is completely worth it. So yeah, this has been my experience. Um, if you have any question, please let me know. Um, yeah, thanks. Awesome, thank you so much Navdeep for your, your summary of your project as well as your experience in the course and the program. Um, just a reminder for anybody who has questions about um, his project or his program experience, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, uh, and we'll take one right here that I see. Um, uh, I th why don't we take one right here that we see before we move on to, to Annika. So uh, question for Navdeep, what's the end goal to get NLP algorithms to understand customer sentiment? What would an enterprise do differently based on findings? So why don't we take one question and then uh, we'll move on to Annika and, and save future questions for the end. But yeah, Navdeep, you got that question? I What's the point? the questions. Uh, so I can tell as much I can, uh, but I'll give you some idea. The way we measure uh, whether customer was happy with uh, uh, any interaction, any services, we use a matrix called NPS. I don't know whether you're familiar with it. It is called Net Promoter Score. And you can read about it, how this thing works. Um, so the key idea, um, and again, this is not uh, uh, described in paper, but uh, it is, we want to correlate between sentiment and uh, sentiment and NPS. Um, so if a positive sen uh, sentiment relates to positive NPS, uh, then uh, we can find out the conversation where we have the positive NPS and then uh, can train agents to have a more conversation like that. So that is one of the use cases. Uh, but um, yeah, I think sentiment is a good clue to improve a user experience. So that is where uh, we are looking to have some improvement. Great. Thanks, Navdeep. So if, uh, some, I see some other folks asking questions as well. I think we'll um, save some of those till after Annika presents as well and sort of do a big block of time for Q&A. 
but up next, uh, thanks, Navjeep. Uh, Annika, uh, who has stayed up, well, not stayed up, but skipped dinner, I suppose, in Europe to join us today. Uh, feel free to um, uh, open up your camera and your mic uh, for your for your slides as well. And Annika will also be sharing her 224U project. And she also completed three classes uh, and the whole AI professional certificate. So Annika, go ahead if you can hear us. Yes, I can hear uh, you. I assume you can hear me as well yep. now, and you yep, can also can. see me. Okay, yep, fine. Everything looks great. So, uh, thanks for having me, and don't mind about my dinner. I always eat late. I'm like more like that midnight dinner type of person, so <laughs> no problem there. Um, yeah. I will um, skip this a little bit. I will first start with introducing who I am because I, I think I might be or I had the feeling during taking the course that I was a little bit of an exotic figure as, or particularly considering my cohort. So um, it might be interesting uh, for you to get to know me a little bit better before learning about my project. Then I will present my, show, uh, my project quite briefly and in the end I will um, have it like the other way around as Navdeep has. In the end I will conclude with uh, certain tips I would give to people, particularly for people who uh, um, come from a similar background as I do and um, recount a bit of some obstacles um, I encountered um, during my way onto the II certif uh, certificate and some yeah, some detours I unnecessarily took and I could have prevented if I planned things differently um, from the beginning. So um, to start with who I am, I am, I think, one of the few people who have taken this um, AI program who um, who does not have a background in computer science or engineering or any hard science at all. I, my background is completely from the social sciences. I have an um, MA in communication studies with a minor in psychology and, and um, um, German literary studies. And um, I am on my way to my doctorate, so my PhD studies in media psychology. So not an engineer, not a computer scientist, a ma mathematician or anything like that. But I do have um, quite a bit of background in programming because um, my work in my, my research primarily focuses on quantitative projects. So I came in touch with SPSS um, um, programming quite early um, back in at university and for my own projects um, incorporated MATLAB quite, quite early on and then switched to um, R. But to be honest, I didn't have that really, really much background in Python programming, just a little bit. Um, I tended um, to switch to Python only every time when I wanted to do something with non-ASCII characters, data sets containing non-ASCII char uh, ASCII characters, because that can be a pain in the ass when you do this in, in R. But I'm not a professional or wasn't a professional when it comes to Python programming. Um, also, I'm not from the industry. I come from the public sector. I am a research assistant uh, currently at the German Police University, which is sounds sounds funny maybe, but it's actually a thing. In Germany, um, it started several years ago that everyone who wants to enter police leadership level will have to have a master's degree or obtain a master's degree from the German Police University. So what I do is that I teach law enforcement officers who want to be leading law enforcement officers, and I do research in the field of online radicalization and particularly their jihadi and uh, right wing online radicalization. So I sort of already came into this project with a strong interest in fields like um, NLP to handle big data, especially social media data. Um, about my project, I ended up doing something completely different from I, or not completely, but quite different from, from what I originally wanted to do. Um, 
my primary goal, um, which with which I started, was to do something, um, yeah, so to have sort of a little bit of um, synergy effects for my PhD project. So I, my my goal was to have a publication by the end of this course, which can be a part of my um, PhD. And so I wanted to do something quite fancy, had a strong, really. Um, developed theoretical background uh, where I wanted to to um, to treat um, social media data for um, um, measure so, sort of um, emotional alignment in different or between different um, extremist communities on the web. However, this didn't quite turn out. Um, Napti have already told you that there's three parts to to this um, course project, and the first one is the literature review. I did this literature review almost entirely on this, and that I wanted to do that, but then found out or had to find out um, the hard way that it's maybe not ideal to to start from a theoretical model or only from a only with with a really cool. Um, hypothesis um, in mind and neglect the fact of which data are already out there or not. And I had to learn that there wasn't really much data which would be ma which um, match my, my hypothesis and I would have to do a lot of data cleaning or um, gathering data myself. And this um, course is certainly not the place for this because you simply do not have the time for this. So I ended up doing something which I found at first um, much smaller than I originally intended. But during my literature review, um, I um, reviewed quite a few um, papers suggesting um, systems for emotion classification. And Naftiv already mentioned things like the um, um, really powerful transformer-based um, language modeling um, techniques and and um, um, vector space models and, and um, word embeddings that became popular recently. And there were quite a few um, papers making really strong points about really nice effect classification systems. However, quite in the end, when I was always almost done with my um, literature review, I came across a paper which is also, um, which I found funny, also a paper that came from uh, a former cohort of the um, this project, uh, this program, not the the um, um, professional program, but the, so to speak, real Stanford um, program. And um, they discussed that all those fancy classification systems um, have a bit of um, a bias when it comes to non-general um, language contexts because we don't express emotions or sentiment always in the same manner, but the way we express emotions or sentiments is at least partially a bit dependent on the context we're in, um, the peers you're communicating with, the, the sub-community you're co uh, communicating in. So these um, models uh, try to, to be a little bit um, unprecise or misclassify a lot of material when you are in really um, exceptional contexts. And I would argue that things like uh, or contexts where extremists are gathering on the internet, for instance, this is a non-general context and uh, a way where emotions might not be expressed as they would be, um, well, in general. So what is needed there is not only a nice algorithm, but also um, for feature selection, dictionaries that portray or are so to speak domain specific to certain contexts. But you can, of course, not generate such a dictionary for every context that's interesting for you and do this manually by hand, because then again, you would only have the dictionaries for once uh, for the context that somebody has already done this before. So we, you would also um, be on the look for for algorithms that might generate such dictionaries more or less automatically for you. And there are some um, label propagation algorithms which have been quite successfully uh, successful in the last years and which I found quite promising. Unfortunately, those label propagation algorithms so far 
have never, never been applied to emotion analysis or emotion um, label um, generation, emotion dictionary generation, but rather to sentiment polarity generation. So only differentiating whether um, something is positive, neutral or negative. And one of the um, most cited or I think one of the most famous um, sentiment propagation algorithms is the scent prop framework developed by Hamilton and colleagues. And so what I wanted to do in this co um, course is something I think quite quite simple or like really, really targeted and really focused um, um, on this specific question is try to make um, the scent prop algorithm work not only for sentiment detection, but also adapt this to the um, to the domain of emotion or effect induction. So those were my two hypotheses. The first one is that because the um, psychometric properties of emotions and sentiment are quite similar, I would argue that the sentiment uh, scent prop algorithm can be leveraged to induce domain specific emotion lexica and also in turn then be, be used to describe um, uh, variations in, in the expression of different emotions in diverse um, radical communities or di different communities on Reddit. And the second hypothesis, um, which is a little bit more, more technical one, um, the Sandprod algorithm, algorithm itself is from 2000, um, stems from 2016. And in the field of NLP, this is almost like I have the feeling like like from the last century or something, because um, this was um, before those um, uh, transformer based um, embeddings became popular, like uh, Roberta or Bird or, or things like this. And so the algorithm is working with already working with embeddings but not with the transformer-based embeddings yet. So my second hypothesis would be that the performance of this algorithm might be boosted or could be boosted even further by implementing um, or incorporating vector uh, transformer-based word representations, and in my case, particularly BERT. However, um, I do not know who of you is already familiar with this these transformer based models um they have a little bit of the downside that um transformer based um word representations come in quite a different format than the usual um lookup table formatted uh, word representations like models like for instance glove or word to vec so um, because they are dynamic representations, which take the context into consideration and the others are static representations. So um, you cannot just um, interchange one model against the other in your algorithm, but you would have to turn those um, um, transformer based um, word representations into static word representations first. And this is something which was quite new. There was one paper, I think I have the reference on the next slide or, or the one after that, um, that um, proposes uh, a method for turning these dynamic context-based word representations back into static ones. And if you do this, you can easily apply them or integrate them in the same uh, um, send prop algorithm. So that was basically all I did was taking two already existing approaches, merging them and applying them to my own hypothesis um, regarding um, emotion detection. And I needed quite a lot of resources um, for this project, um, which I will point this out um, later on, can be uh, something, um, yeah, probably dangerous. Um, so make sure not to be needy of too many different resources because gathering resourcing, uh, resources, aligning them, cleaning them might be much more work than you expect them to, uh, it to be. The first um, set of resources which I needed were so-called seed words um, from which the SendProp algorithm um, progresses. I will explain this on the next slide. and. Um, Hamilton already came up with uh, seed words for uh, sentiments. I don't know if you can read them there. I, I guess a little bit um, a little bit small here. And he um, 
for each sentiment, um, positive, um, he, he, uh, negative, he started off with 10 seed words, one representing the positive and one the, uh, the other 10 the negative um, um, scale. And I did the same by simply choosing by help <laughs> with the help of the Webster dictionary, good representations of the positive scales of um, certain emotions. In my case, I, I chose contempt, disgust and anger, which has a bit to do with my theoretical background in the social science or in the field of radicalization research. There is a model which is called the so-called Akondi model, which states that um, discourses on the web tend to become particularly violent when you have anger, disgust and contempt um, combined. So um, I investigated those three particular emotions or effects. And those words were chosen by myself. Then I needed to gather word embeddings and therefore I took the um, already static, so to speak, standard um, word embeddings like glove, Twitter train, uh, glove trained on Twitter, word to vec, and then also applied um, the um, static um, or turning um, dynamic representations into static representations algorithm um, proposed by Bomanzani and colleagues um, to the bird uh, to the bird model. So those were my my uh, three types of uh, word embeddings I chose. Then I gathered um, Reddit data, and um, therefore I I used the push shift um, API, um, which is a quite straightforward method to gather those data. So I could um, within several minutes or hours um, really crawl a huge date, a Reddit data set which didn't need much more cleaning um, afterwards anymore. And then finally, um, which is also will be clearer on the next slide, I needed so-called target category dictionaries uh, against which I could test um, the performance of the algorithm. Those were dictionaries that already um, listed words associated with either um, sentiment polarity or certain effects. So I could test how well or um, have a measure how well the algorithm actually works by comparing the dictionary that the algorithm produced against the dictionaries which have already been, so to speak, ratified by other people or by the vast um, scientific community for those contexts. And so this is... Um, the scheme or the overall scheme of the um, um, I built, which partly uh, partly was done um, within the course project, but a little bit of this what is here in the in the workflow charge is still pending. Is something I would want to do um, or I'm doing now because I um, would want to have this done before I upload or publish the paper. But um, in the end, I was running out of time. So it was still a big of an endeavor to, to do everything or accomplish everything I would like to have done. Um, and But what I, I did or what the, the algorithm basically is supposed to do is that it starts off with a selection of um, word embedding spaces, um, either the static ones like um, Virtuvec or Glove or the more fancy, newer, supposedly better word embedding spaces like BIRD, which uh, are then turned into static representation by the Pomanzani algorithm. And what the SENPROP algorithm and its care function, uh, core functionality does is that it takes those embedding spaces and applies uh, k-nearest neighbor modeling um, to it so that it creates sort of like a map um, or um, a landscape um, of those those words, and um, um, sorts them or opposes them um, uh, next to each other or far away from each other, according to to the similarity of context in which they appear. And so you you can sort of have like a graph representation of your entire vocabulary. And then in the next step, and this is why we needed the seed words. We are starting random works in, the, in this embedding space from the chosen seed works that you know or you said are either representing the positive or the negative scale of an emotion. And then you apply several um, 
random walks across the um, um, this um, graph representation. And depending on how often or if at all um, one word hits or, or crosses another word um, in this vocabulary, uh, starting off from those seed words, you can say that it's either associated with this part or the other other pole of the emotion. And you do this repeatedly several times. And by this, you can sort of create your dictionary lists, which you can then use to to um, describe your um, models later on. And what I would like to do uh, further on is um, to also um, test this against um, other algorithms for emotion classification um, at the sentence level, but I was not there yet. But what I could accomplish in the uh, during the course of this this um, course project is test this model if it works at all for emotions, and if it works better when you um, incorporate uh, um, transformer-based uh, language models. And what you can see is that it's you have a little bit of mixed results. I don't know if you can read this table, but um, what I found out is then when you are um, having standard English domains, you are still better off um, implementing the the systems um, that were proposed in the original algorithm, so not relying on on um, on um, BERT as your embedding space. But when you want to target emotions, particularly in online media like, like Twitter or, or Reddit, then you actually have this um, hypothesized boost in performance when you use um, transformer-based vector space models. And this is just, um, so to, to um, put this in context a little bit again, if you use those um, emotion word lists that you can induce with this procedure, you can indeed find, if you compare your web communities across these, that you find certain similarities that, for instance, all the the radical communities like the red pill community where we have the incels um, discussing um, highly misogynist topics for, and and the far right people, they all find for, um, have a similar way of expressing, uh, expressing um, different emotions when you um, apply this send prop algorithm first. So it's actually um, a nice way for me as a social scientist to find out um, something actually on, on how emotion is expressed. So it's not only a, a technical issue. Um, for me as a social scientist, of course, I don't know. I'm not only interested if a bird model is better than, than glove or something, but I really want to know what it's good for in the end. How can I describe a social phenomena with this? And this is really something pretty useful to describe social phenomena because it really helps me identify or cluster particularly radical um, communities on the web. Um, yeah, that's what Monica, I we'll did. Go, uh, What's one, the... more, one more minute if you have. And then we'll leave yes. we want to uh, make sure we have some time for questions. So we'll go for one more uh, minute. Yeah, I will speed that up. Um, just what is still left to do is I would like to um, um, test this with uh, also with another um, word embedding space, the bird tweet, which is particularly um, might be even better because it's tailored towards um, online materials, not general language, but online um, um, discourses. Then I would like to um, test this way of, of classifying or finding emotions in um, discourses also on the, on the sentence level because um, and test this against other algorithms, the, the baseline algorithms, which are proposed at the moment by the um, Go Emotion data set, which is, I think, the benchmark emotion data set to test uh, emotion classification. And then, of course, I would like to tidy up my, my code, I think, which is something that everyone always does, because I, I on the last slide, I put a link to my um, also my GitHub repository. So if you're ever having imposter syndrome or something, take a look at this. This is how actual messy code looks like at the end of such a project. So yes. 
And I think we don't have much time for this anymore, so I leave this to, to maybe reading. Those are the, the tips I would have um, for the um, for mastering this program, especially when you're a social scientist and maybe used to work quite differently normally. But yeah, maybe we will touch upon several of these aspects in this discussion now. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing a super fascinating topic and, and background also. It's great to that you're able to share sort of where you came from for the program. Um, from here in the last 10 minutes, we'll talk a little bit about the program. And uh, we have some questions here that I'll try to cover as we talk about it very briefly, but I'll also ask uh, Navdeep uh, and Anika to chime in with any thoughts that they have as well um, on some of these questions. And uh, we can share Anika's paper and GitHub profile, as she mentioned, uh, for folks who are still interested in browsing that. So um, as mentioned, um, let me advance these slides and we can share that out. This was just one project. <laughs> or one, uh, one assignment from all of these courses. Um, I believe Navdeep took two, two, the NLP class, the NLU class, and I forgot what his third was. Uh, it was his 229. Um, all of these courses are based off of graduate material at Stanford. So you actually do use the uh, regular graduate classroom lectures. So for those of you, we get a lot of questions about the machine learning class that Andrew Ng teaches versus the Coursera course. Um, the graduate, the courses that we have in the professional program go to much more additional levels of depth and breadth uh, from the course on, on Coursera, which is a great uh, starter and introduction to some of these things. Um, a question that we got several times in the chat was whether or not it's recommended to take two classes at once. Um, in general, we recommend that it's not because we find that a lot of the classes take eight hours to 15 hours a week. And sometimes people spend more depending on what they're doing on the project or what their background in Python is. So uh, Navdeep or Anika, I'm not sure if you wanna chime in with thoughts. The time commitment also varies by class. Some are more math heavy, some are more programming heavy. And to be honest, it actually depends on what your background is and your, your comfort with both. But um, Navdeep, do you wanna share anything from your experience or Anika from your experience sure. and or in your opinion? In general, our guidance is not to do two at once, but I'm curious if you all have any thoughts. Sure, I think I if you are a working professional, one course is more than enough. You will find <laughs> even though, yeah, I mean, I made this XCS 2 to 4 you as my work. I don't think I would have been able to finish it if it was not my work project. It's a lot of work. Uh, again, it depends on you. Do you just want to clear those assignment, get and pass it? or you want to learn uh, all the concepts, like go deeper into it. And I think that is where one course at a time, is. you'll find that it is more than enough. It will take your whole week um, if you are really interested in knowing the concept rather than just passing the course. So I would recommend one at a time. Yeah. And Anika, I don't know if you had anything to add or if you did them one by one, but um, in general, the guidance is to to take one. Yeah, for me, definitely also one at the time, if I may go back in the slides here, there's something I might recommend for someone who has, like, like me, also a plain social science background. I started with the, I think, math heaviest of all courses with the 229 one, which was quite challenging for me. And I was quite glad that there was this example test set on the on the page before the enrollment. So I even started to to set back for three entire months before enrolling into this course and uh, redid um, calculus and lin linear algebra on, on Khan Academy because otherwise I would not definitely would not have passed this course because my my um, high school math is still so many years back and um, yeah so that was really yes. challenging so um, yeah. So that leads to a, an additional question that we got a couple times in here, which is about prerequisites. Um, we do, uh, you know, it is recommended you have a strong math background in calculus, linear algebra, but you can also, you know, we don't require that you go take a formal class. Um, there's free resources on Khan Academy. There's also a great specialization. Uh, I think it's called Math for Machine Learning. That's on Coursera offered by um I think uh, UCL in, in London, that many folks we see do before they take the course. 
ultimately, because this is a professional program, our admissions are fairly open. We ask you to self-report your, your, your math background and your statistics background and your Python background, but there's no entrance exam uh, or anything like that. Um, and then for the assignments, another question that I see here is what language are the assignments in? Um, the assignments are in Python. And um, most of the courses actually have assignments in just raw Python files, which I think Navdeep mentioned. Um, you know, you'll, you'll be working to build things from scratch. And then two of the classes, including 224U, which we're talking about today, um, uh, uh, use Jupyter Notebooks. But most of the classes actually use uh, raw Python files. And um, the environment looks like this, where you'll have uh, an assignment, you'll submit it to our auto grader, and it will provide you with feedback and, and results. Um, throughout the course, there's also support from course facilitators who uh, you can go to with your questions uh, for the course. And we have a Slack community where you can ask questions about assignments as well as schedule office hours um, with a dedicated point of contact. Um, one question that I see here in the chat from a couple of people that, that Anika and Navdeep can both speak to is potentially sort of like kind of what's the overlap or what's the perspective of 224U versus 224N? Um, one person asked about taking them at the same time, which we've covered, I think. But can you talk a little bit about, you know, I have my view, but your experience in, in, uh, in I know Navdeep definitely took both. Anika, I'm not sure if you took both, but Navdeep, can you, can you if you did, can you yeah. talk a little bit about the areas of overlap, the areas of difference, and kind of like how the two elements of 224N and 224U actually may fit together for somebody who's interested in diving into that whole universe? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, so both are very different courses. Uh, the first one, 224N, you learn uh, from the scratch about uh, evaluation, evolution of uh, natural language uh, processing techniques. So some of the concepts even goes uh, back, like uh, what was there in 90s to up to a point RNN and it comes up to a stage where you get introduced to concept of attention and transformer, but there is uh, no practical application there for assignment. And NLU picks up where I think uh, NLP left, which was like, you can literally, you will from first assignment itself, you'll be applying some of those transformer based model for uh, uh, word embedding and things like that. So from learning perspective and application perspective, I think it's a good journey. Um, now, again, like there are lots of things, right? Uh, as Steve also highlighted, what is your background? How much you already know? If you already know how Python works, if you are familiar with like uh, sequential models, RNN models, and you are just want to learn the new concept. So xcs 224 u I think has newer concepts, but again, I think uh, they keep on updating. So like, I'm not sure if has there been any update for uh, XCS 224N. Uh, I would recommend both in a sequence, uh, but it depends on like what you are trying to achieve. Do you have a timeline issue? Um, do you have something in mind you want to work on immediately? Then if you just want to grab uh, understanding of the latest, go for XCS 224U but only if you already understand lots of ML concept, otherwise start with CS2 before and. Yeah. Monica was, I don't know sure if you have anything to add or if that was experience as well. We do see that about 60 to 70% of people in 224U took 224N first. So it's not a hard requirement of ours, but we actually see more than half of people do that. Yes, I, I did the same <laughs> also. Um... <laughs> I, I think uh, I would not uh, change the order of my courses. I really started with this math-heavy, um, somewhat nasty 229, and from then proceeded with 224N, which is, like Navdeep said, really about the basic concepts. And it's nice because then you have like the first way of applying the math you learned in 229. And, and then two, two, um, for you is like really hands on, you're like thrown more or less thrown into the open water and you can do whatever you like, which gives you a lot of freedom, but also, um, can be a bit, um, intimidating or this is, um, 
something I might uh, probably want to add to the coding language question. You already mentioned that we are um, the bake-offs and everything you do in um, before you start with your project in 229U is primarily based on Jupyter Notebooks which are nice, but that was kind of one of the obstacles I encountered. I wanted to go on for my course project also with Jupyter Notebooks, and they are really not ideal for debugging and really developing a project. They are nice when you're using frameworks, but not when you're working something from scratch and you will be spending 90% of your time debugging code. And um, so I started to set up my IDA, uh, IDE way too late in the project. And um, this is something I would give as a really strong recommendation before you start with 229U um, and you do not have much background in Python, only ever had like two or three Jupyter notebooks or so, get yourself familiar with, with an IDE and start a little bit of debugging and get to know debugging beforehand and not on the course. This won't work or will make time management really challenging otherwise. Awesome. Um, well, we have reached the top of the hour. We apologize for not being able to get to all of the questions, but if you do have further questions, I see some questions about logistics and about the course availability and those types of things. Uh, you should feel free to get in touch with our team um, uh, with those questions uh, around course availability and ordering and those types of things. Um, and the last thing I wanted to share is we do have a few profiles. Uh, you just heard from Anika and Navdeep about their journey and their learnings. We have a couple of other profiles uh, posted on our website as well about how different people have used this program and used these courses to um, further their interests and their learning and their career. And so we encourage you to check those out um, uh, as well. So with that, I just want to again thank Navdeep and Anika for joining us, for sharing their projects, for talking a little bit. Um, about their experience in the program. These, these projects are always so interesting. We could talk for hours about them and there's tons of, people always have tons of questions. So they're always fascinating to hear. Uh, we wanna thank you both uh, for your time and for sharing and uh, for everybody who joined this as well. And so this webinar will be shared out um, with everyone. And as I mentioned, if we do have questions that we were not able to address, uh, you should feel free to get in touch with our team. So thank you so much, Anika. Enjoy your dinner. Thank you so much, Navdeep. Uh, appreciate you sharing your project and uh, thank you everybody for joining.